Hello fellow health seeking humans, if you're new to my channel, my name is Jake. In recent years, we've been hearing a lot about the gut-brain axis, which refers to the biochemical signaling between the GI tract and the central nervous system. And I know what you're thinking to yourself right now. You're thinking, oh my goodness, those earrings that she's wearing are so beautiful. Where can I buy them? And don't worry, I have the answer. You can find the... <laughs> You can find the link in the video description box to my Etsy store below. This is my emerald version. It comes in several colors, and that's why my eyes are emerald green today. Emerald green is the color. When talking about the microbiome and the gut-brain axis, this is sometimes referred to as the microbiota gut-brain axis. The vast majority of research that has been done on the interplay between the microbiome and the brain has been done using stool samples, but the team at Cedar sinai have shown us that stool samples are not a valid way to gauge what is going on in the small intestine. The small intestine has a much smaller biomass than the biomass of the colon and the microbiome is significantly different. And this makes sense because the job of the small intestine is to digest your food and extract nutrients, while the colon recovers water and electrolytes and expels waste, aka shit. So with the knowledge that stool is not representative of what's going on in the GI tract, you have to be careful when you're reading research about the gut microbiome. How did the researchers define what the gut microbiome is, and is that a valid way of defining the gut microbiome? I personally am trying to move away from using the term gut. When people say heal, heal your gut, it's so general as to be useless. How are you supposed to heal your gut if you don't know what part of the gut it needs to be? Be healed and in what way. I'm going to instead try to use the word GI tract because GI stands for gastro and intestinal and gastro is the stomach and intestinal are the intestines. And then I guess the word digestive system is great too because that recognizes not only from mouth to anus but also the other organs that are involved in digestion like the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder. And I'm going to try to make it clear when I'm talking about the small intestine versus the large intestine or different parts of the small intestine intestine, etc, etc. Since researchers are only just starting to appreciate the importance of the small intestine, research on how SIBO might cause symptoms outside of the GI tract is in its infancy. I mean, actually, it's, I wouldn't even say it's an infant. It hasn't even been born yet. It's like crowning. So I asked both of my GI doctors how they thought SIBO might cause brain symptoms. One said that science doesn't know for sure, research is on the way, and there's probably more than one mechanism through which SIBO can cause brain symptoms. So very specific. The other one said that in the case of hydrogen sulfide, the gas is toxic, so it could reach the brain and may cause symptoms that way, but he thought that the other toxic byproducts that microbes can produce, as opposed to the gases themselves, are the mechanism by which it may cause brain symptoms in SIBO. So more specific, um, we still don't really know. So I want you to take all of the research and hypotheses and speculation in this video with a grain of salt or maybe even the whole damn salt shaker. I used to grind this in middle school. Shake it like a salt shaker, 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 shake it like a salt shaker. Like salt shaker. Like salt shaker. Got all the boys with those moves. A recent study by Dr. Satish Rao and colleagues looked at the link between brain fog, bloating, SIBO, and D-lactic acidosis. Dr. Satish Rao sometimes publishes with the team at Cedar sinai including Dr. Pimentel. In this study, 30 participants had brain fog, which was marked by poor short-term memory, mental confusion, difficulty with concentration, and impaired judgment, like grinding in middle school. Okay, side note, my friend showed me, it's very popular on TikTok and Instagram now for like 12 year old girls to be dancing very sexily and I started looking at it and it, I just thought it was pretty over the top and now I think my algorithm thinks I'm a pervert and they keep showing me 12 year old girls dancing sexily and I don't want to keep seeing that. Most of these patients experienced postprandial brain fog, which means after eating, and these episodes could last anywhere from 30 minutes to several hours. In addition to brain fog, 28 of the 30 patients also experienced postprandial fatigue and weakness. 
In 13% of patients, brain fog was so severe that they had to quit their jobs. After eating large carbohydrate-rich meals, one patient had near syncopal episodes, which means near fainting or passing out, and another woman was bedridden for up to a week. One patient experienced a blistering rash on the palms. Huh. My mom just made a joke that I have to probably cut out, and I think you can extrapolate what that joke was. So the research examined 30 patients with brain fog and 8 patients without brain fog for SIBO, lactic acidosis, and probiotic use. All studies have their limitations and research has to start off somewhere, but it should be pointed out that 8 control patients is a very small number. All 38 patients had GI symptoms like bloating, distension, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and belching. Lactic acidosis has been described in those with short bowel syndrome, and short bowel syndrome is sort of what it sounds like. It refers to a condition in which part of the intestine had been surgically removed or part of the intestines were damaged or missing at birth, and some websites say it refers to the small intestine, while others say it refers to the small or large intestine, Whatever, it doesn't really matter for what we're talking about today. Regardless, in short bowel syndrome, patients can have lactic acidosis, and that just refers to lactic acid buildup. The lactic acid buildup comes from overproduction of D-lactate from certain microorganisms like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And this overproduction basically overwhelms the liver's ability to detoxify and break down the lactic acid, and that leads to the brain symptoms that I mentioned earlier. So the researchers found a few things. One was that but those who had brain fog were significantly more likely to have lactic acidosis than those without brain fog, but once again, the control was only eight people. They also found that 68% of patients with brain fog had SIBO, as evidenced by a glucose breath test or fluid aspiration from the distal part of the duodenum. Furthermore, all of the patients with brain fog were taking probiotics for a duration anywhere from three months to three years, and all of the probiotics con contained lactobacillus or bifidobacterium species. Also, over a third of those with brain fog were eating cultured yogurt. While on the other hand, only one in the non-brain fog group was taking probiotics. The researchers then asked all of those taking probiotics to stop taking the probiotics, and they treated the ones with SIBO with various antibiotics just depending on their individual case. After treatment, 70% of patients reported improvement in their GI symptoms, and perhaps even more impressively, 85% of patients reported a complete resolution in brain fog. The authors conclude that the brain fog was likely due to the production of toxic metabolites, including D-lactic acid, in the small intestine from bacterial fermentation of carbohydrates. I just went to the bathroom and looked at myself in the mirror and realized I had lip scum. You know when you have that, like, scummy line around your lips? And I'm sorry I made you look at that, except I'm not really all that sorry because if that's the worst thing that's happened to you today, then you're, you're having a, a really good day. They also concluded that the use of probiotics and, in some patients, cultured yogurt contributed to the colonization of the small intestine by lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, which can produce D-lactic acid. Probiotic usage in those with SIBO is somewhat of a controversial thing, and I'm not ready to say it's all good or all bad. I would say maybe it's very individualized. I can tell you that for me, both of my GI doctors, who are both SIBO experts, have advised for me not to take probiotics at this time. So it's just something to keep in mind that probiotics are supposed to reach the colon, but we don't know under what conditions and which formulations are actually reaching the colon, and some of them may colonize the small intestine especially with those with slow motility in the small intestine, with which many, if not most, with SIBO have. So D-lactic acidosis is just one example of a proposed mechanism. Another is the overproduction of ammonia. Rifaximin is FDA-approved for three conditions, traveler's diarrhea, IBSD, and hepatic encephalopathy. Let's break down the word, hepatic encephalopathy. So the hepatic part refers to the liver, and the encephalopathy, the encephalopathy, law is uh, the brain and pathy is pathology or disease. 
Hepatic encephalopathy usually occurs in those who have cirrhosis of the liver, and cirrhosis refers to late-stage scarring of the liver, and this is found in those with hepatitis or chronic alcoholism. There are different levels of hepatic encephalopathy. Patients can range from having slight changes in memory, personality, coordination, and concentration, and it can range to disorientation, fits of rage, and even coma. Now, I'm not saying that people with SIBO have hepatic encephalopathy. What I am saying is that we can learn from more severe diseases like hepatic encephalopathy and apply the proposed mechanisms by which they cause symptoms to less severe diseases like SIBO. The mechanism by which hepatic encephalopathy causes brain symptoms is also not fully understood. In general, it's thought that hepatic encephalopathy occurs when too many neurotoxic substances enter the brain, like short vein chatty acids. What? Chatty acids. Yeah, yeah. If I was an acid, I'd be very chatty. So short chain fatty acids, ammonia, manganese, and false neurotransmitters and others things, others things. I stand by that, others things. These neurotoxic substances may enter cells in the brain called astrocytes. Astrocytes? That kind of sounds like something, doesn't it? This is another joke I'm probably gonna have to cut out. Astrocytes play a role in the detoxification of ammonia in the brain, and they play a role in the blood-brain barrier. Ammonia is produced as a byproduct by the microbes in our GI tract by the foods that we eat. And ammonia is detoxified in the liver as well, but in the case of cirrhosis, the liver is severely compromised. Ammonia is neurotoxic in a variety of ways, so just one example is that it can inhibit the inhibitory and excitatory nerve impulses in the central nervous system. If you want to learn more about hepatic encephalopathy and ways of managing it, that, and some of it is nutritional, that might help some SIBO patients, I don't know, but I'll put a link in the video description box below this video. A lot of the research that has been done on hepatic encephalopathy and the microbiome has been done on stool samples and colonic biopsies, but I um, am guessing and hoping that in the future more emphasis will be put on the small intestine. So there is a very high prevalence of SIBO in those with cirrhosis, anywhere from 35 to 60 percent. And people with cirrhosis have a higher prevalence of slow small intestine. Slow people with cirrhosis have a higher prevalence of people with cirrhosis have a higher prevalence of sl <laughs> <laughs> I think you just have bad dentures now. I think my tongue's too fat. <laughs> yeah, that's the only fat thing I know. Oh, it was kind of a wide sloth. <laughs> you were like actually horrified. You're like, oh. So touchy. No, no, it was, I was reminded. I, oh. I was, yeah, I was reminded it's the that it, it's, <laughs> it, was, it was like, oh. <laughs> And people with cirrhosis have a higher likelihood of slowed small intestinal motility, and they have a higher likelihood of intestinal permeability, aka leaky gut, but I hate the word gut. Gut out of here! <laughs> Kind of a mom joke. Total mom joke. joke. So we can't assume causation of any of these things, but we know that there is a relationship between SIBO, hepatic encephalopathy, and cirrhosis. So what D-lactic acidosis and hepatic encephalopathy show us is that the link between the GI tract and the liver is a strong one. And actually, as I said earlier, the liver as well as the pancreas and the gallbladder are part of the digestive system. And this was news to me fairly recently. <laughs> In both D-lactic acidosis and hepatic encephalopathy, there are toxic metabolites from microbes that escape the lumen of the GI tract, and the liver cannot keep up with the detoxifying, breaking down processing, whatever verb you want to use, of those toxic metabolites. And there's also most likely immune activation from the intestinal permeability component and just probably generalized inflammation. So based on this research and what my doctor said, I speculate that with SIBO there is a similar pathophysiology. There is an overgrowth and dysbiosis of microbes in the small intestine. This is accompanied by slow small intestinal motility, intestinal permeability, immune activation, and perhaps generalized inflammation. 
there's an overproduction of these toxic metabolites, some of which pass through the intestinal wall, and the liver is not able to keep up with this overproduction. These metabolites may reach the brain directly or cause inflammation in other ways and may cause symptoms like brain fog, fatigue, mood disorders like anxiety and depression, and headaches. We don't know exactly what these toxic metabolites are, but I suspect there are many. In a future video, I will talk about the possible symptoms that SIBO might cause outside of the GI tract, so brain symptoms and maybe even skin symptoms. So hit that subscribe button so you can make sure that you don't miss that video. And now in retrospect, I'm thinking that video might have made more sense to come before this video, but um, nobody's perfect. I gotta work it. If you're new to my channel, my name is Jake. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and share it wherever you can. I really want to make helping people navigate their health with these edutainment videos my job, and there are a few ways you can help me do that. The first way is through shopping these gorgeous emerald earrings that you can find in my Etsy store. You can also shop my Bartonella Babe merch. 25% of proceeds go to the Bartonella Project at the North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. And if you are in a position to do so, you can donate to my channel via PayPal or Venmo, and the information for that is in the video description box below this video. You kind of always look like you have brain fog. Maybe Piper <laughs> has SIBO. If she did a breath test, it would knock out whoever was administering the breath test, us. It'd probably kill us. It's toxic. Bye fellow health seeking humans.